All right, all right, perfect. Are you guys ready for the show? All right, coming to the stage, we have Mary Ann Ivan. And after that, we've got the great Paul Maggio. And please welcome Kate Chapman. We're definitely naughty, but most of all, we're craving still adore. We want you to feel better, no matter what the weather, or if the voice inside your head is loud. Come join the crowd to see the show. At the end of the hour, we'll know each other better. better, better. So let's all have some fun. It's the Kate Chapman Show. Feel better hour. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the Kate Chapman Show. This is a show that's all about feeling better, and I have up here two people who make me feel better every single time I'm around them. And we're going to talk to them and introduce you for just two seconds. And uh, while we're on the show today, we're going to learn a lot about things that you can do for yourself for free, because I'm all about free. So um, first of all, let me introduce you to the one, the only, the incredible Marianne Ivan. <laughs> Mary Ann and I have known each other for 21 years. Wow. Mm. 21 years. Mm. 21 years. It's been a long 21 years for her. <laughs> 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 um, Mary and I met doing a production of Beehive. Does anybody know what that is? A musical about all the, the 60s music. And um, I got hired to play Janis Joplin, which was puzzling for me. <laughs> because I went into the first rehearsal like, Busted flat in Baton Rouge. Waiting for a train. <laughs> the music director didn't think that was right. It's just a little off. Yeah. So what do we do instead? Take it! Take another little piece of my heart now, baby. Break it! Take another little piece of my heart, my heart, yeah. I think I need to be 25 with the wig. We'll, we'll, we'll go back there and time it on yeah, memory. Those only. purple velvet pants were great. <laughs> I know, they were great. Um, so anyway, Mare, yes. what is something that you do for yourself to make you feel better for free? One Ooh. of my most favorite things to do is to haunt cemeteries. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a website I go to, findagrave.com, for real. And uh, it's a whole picture history, where cemeteries are located. If you're into that historical thing. And I like to run around New York City finding famous dead people. George Gershwin has his mausoleum about a mile and a half right up from the shop. So I went and uh, talked to George last week. It was really great. So, And what about you, Mr. Maggio? Because you Ooh. and I have known each other for 18 years. 18 I know all these people years. for a long time, right? We're almost legal. <laughs> We're almost legal. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Um, and Paul and I work at the dreaded day job. Dum, 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 dum. Hey, but we have to be careful what we say. Some of those people are here today. And they're some of my favorite people in the world. A lot of artists in New York City have to have a day job, and Paul and I are no different. Mm -hmm. But what do we do at the day job to make ourselves feel better? Well, you know, for me, I just love to greet everyone when they come in because we work with an incredibly talented group of people, actors, writers, dancers, musicians, health coaches. And you know, I just love to just talk about their shows and tell them how fabulous they are. And that's one of my favorite things. I walk in work and I hear Paul say, you're fabulous. <laughs> how can that not make you feel better? <laughs> it's on, it's a recording though, Kate. Like, no, 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 I thought it was no, live, no, 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 it was memorized. We're live, okay. okay. Anyway, they're not all good. We're writing them as we go. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we get some experts up here, though, that can tell us more than just, you know, what we do to make ourselves feel better for free. I would like to welcome to our stage an amazing woman that I just met, thanks to Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a yoga instructor and a clown. Mm -hmm. And a storyteller. And a storyteller. Mm -hmm. So please welcome to the stage, 
Julie Pascal. I have, I have blue cards, just like the real pros do. <laughs> it makes me feel very, very um, professional. <laughs> Let's see if I can read anything that I wrote on them. So, um, Julie, thank you for coming, first oh, of all. Um, and I just, first off, I want to say that I'm wearing yoga pants. Uh -huh. I wear them almost every day. As do I. <laughs> I do yoga twice a year. <laughs> How do you get somebody like me to actually get on the mat and do a downward dog? Well, I, what I always say is I think that yoga, I, I call yoga actually the good crack because once you get a taste of yoga, you want more. And I think really for me what I think about is yoga is really like, uh, it's a Swiss army knife of things because it's if you want a physical workout that is really quite balanced, like a lot of athletics and a lot of like dance forms only work your muscles in one particular way. Yoga is very balanced. It's what we call externally rotated, internally rotated, and in addition, and there's also styles of yoga for everyone, right? People sometimes think only of like hot yoga or restorative yoga or vinyasa yoga. There is literally a style of yoga for everybody. Is there lazy yoga? Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be lazy yoga. You'd be more restorative yoga where they plop you up on blocks and make you feel Ooh. yummy. And people come with essential oils Ooh. and massaging. Yes. So a certain that amount of it <laughs> is finding the proper kind of yoga, but then also knowing that like, you're a busy lady, I take it. Mm -hmm. And if you want something that is both physically good for you and emotionally good for you, meaning that it calms what we call the, in yoga the chitta, the, 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 the crazy stuff running around in your brain, yoga's the ticket. Because through the body, we work on subtle layers. So there's the gr what we call the gross body. Not meaning the body's gross, but sometimes it is. But it means the tangible. I touch them as a yoga teacher, I know. Right? The tangible part of the body. But then we have more subtle layers. And through working with those subtle layers and this part of our brain called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is different from fight or flight, this mm -hmm. is rest and digest, you, through this wonderful movement that's good for the more tangible part of your body, you touch on the less tangible part of your body, which also makes you relax. So you can get the, I feel good, and I feel good at the same time. I like that. Yeah. Maybe I'll do it more than twice. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be drawn back into it. And I do say that when, when I do do it, I feel, I, do, I, I feel younger, I feel more pliable, I feel stronger. Um, it reminds me a little bit when I was a kid and I would do gymnastics. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that. It's, I, I, think, I think for me, it's such a, a completely different time like, speed than what we do in life here in New York City, right? New York City is just oh, all go, 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 go. And so I think it's like switching that, f that, that switch right. to be like, I have to slow down. Now. Right. Because even if you're doing like a, what was called a vigorous practice, mm -hmm. And so you're really moving and stuff like that. There's a certain amount of quiet that comes in through the poses. And that's related to what I was saying about this system, because most of us are on the sympathetic nervous system 24-7. Our adrenals are firing because we're right. all yeah. the time, right? right? We're always going. And so, and that's good for a certain, we need to get stuff done. But too much of that, and I understand you'll have a doctor in later, too much of that leads, leads to dis-ease. Right disease right. and so that's why the yoga practices are so powerful because even though you can be really vigorously holding poses sweat and get a good workout at the same time these poses are so wonderfully designed from thousands of years ago that at the same time it's also having this qu quieting on like I said these subtler parts of the body this energetic if you will of the body so right. the muscles are getting the feel the burn but the subtler bodies are getting this okay relax and a lot of that has to do with the fact that you are breathing so deeply Wonderful. Okay, so you are also a clown, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I want to talk about. Um, how did you decide to become a clown? Um, it sort of picked me, <laughs> almost. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I was a, a, a chorus girl uh, for quite some time, and one summer I had broken my arm, and so I missed out on auditions and stuff. And because of my size and my energetic, I always did a lot of children's theater shows, and I've always loved kids. And I saw in backstage, Big Apple Circus Clown Care looking for summer replacement performers for their hospital program. And I've always sort of like been like 
goody good doer. And I thought, oh, working with kids in hospital. I had no clue what really clowning was, but I thought, really wrongly, I thought, how hard could it be? Right. Um, <laughs> so I strolled up, and they actually let me in a hospital. We don't do auditions like that anymore. Yeah. You have to audition in a studio, and then you go into the hospital. But they let me loose with a bunch of kids, and I had them laughing. And um, it's like, as one of my bosses said, the hooks were in, and 17 years later, I'm still Dr. I'm a Confused, mostly at Harlem Hospital, and it is a job that is really, it's actually the job that led me to yoga, um, needing to find breath, and a lot of what I do, clowning is different, it's interesting, in this country, people think of clown, they think of circus clown, mm -hmm. Ronald McDonald and birthday clown. Clowning actually predates circus. It comes from the comedia. So the type of clowning that we do, particularly, I don't wear a lot of makeup because I'm in with hospitalized children. So just imagine that, like the scary it clown coming yeah, into yeah, your yeah. room. <laughs> right. Hi, you've just come out of surgery. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those drugs, no! Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and sometimes I hesitate when people are like, and you're a clown, I wait to see their reaction. Because some people's like, you're a clown, and other people's like, <laughs> and I would say I'm not that kind of clown. It's more like I think Lucille Ball is one of my idols. She, you know, she's clown. How yeah. Lloyd, Buster Keith, those people. So a lot of what I do is is physical comedy, walking into walls. And nothing a kid that's in a hospital bed likes likes better is seeing someone in pain more than they are. <laughs> so we always work in teams of two. So slapstick is huge. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what I call your schadenfreude of showing, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. I think we all have it. Yeah. Well, Julie, I wish that we had more time with you, but we don't because I scheduled a huge show. Um, so thank you, thank you You're for coming and so just much. giving us a little, I, I, will get, I will get out of the chair and okay. into some restorative yoga because I like the idea of somebody putting essential oils <laughs> <Yeah>. over <laughs> so I can relax. Um, and please continue with the clowning. The thank kids you. need it, and it's incredible work that you do. And thank you, thank you for coming. You're welcome. And uh, Polio, what do you have to tell us? <laughs> um, isn't it rich? Aren't they a pair? Uh. Send in the clowns. <laughs> if you only knew, I know. how many times I've heard that song and the phrase, <laughs> stop clowning around. <laughs> <laughs> then I have to do yoga. <laughs> well, you know what makes me feel better? Taking a break. And this one is brought to you by Pixie's Prescription Chapter 12, Joy. Joy isn't just a dishwashing detergent or a co-host on The View. It's a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. What brings you joy? What could bring you more joy? Find out where your joy resides and give it a voice far beyond your singing. So um, I'm going to give you like little just song interludes. Mostly it's for me. It's not really even for you because singing calms me down and so I need to calm down because clearly I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs>
Is there a doctor in the house? I think there might be a doctor in the house. <laughs> and I'm very excited about it uh, well, because I chased her down. Um, well, you know, now we'd like to bring to our stage Director of Women and Heart Disease at Lenox Hill Hospital right here in New York City. Let's give her a warm welcome, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum. <laughs> geared up here. Dr. Suzanne or Dr. Steinbaum? Dr. Suzanne. Dr. Suzanne. So Dr. Suzanne, I saw you speak at a conference and I was so taken with her that I, I, I stalked her a little bit and I tracked her down and then I sent emails saying, I really need you to come to my show and she called and she's here. I'm just so excited about it. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad you stopped me. Um, you primarily focus upon women's heart health, is that correct? Yes. So this all started about 12 years ago when we realized more women were dying of heart disease than men. And really there was not that much being done about it. The research wasn't there. The access to care was different. And it was the beginning of the Go Red for Women movement through the American Heart Association. And tell us about the Go Red for Women movement. It was started now 13 years ago, and it was started by women for women for the empowerment, education, awareness, and research for women in heart disease. Okay, and uh, isn't that great, guys? I think that's amazing. Um, I think one of the things that I think is surprising, it was surprising to me when I learned it, and I think it's surprising to a lot of people, is that women really have been strangely marginalized in medicine in a way in terms of the fact that the the drugs aren't really tested on women they're not uh, you know kind of, you it is the craziest thing and and I have to say that when I started my training I was a resident I really didn't know what I was going to do and there was a woman, she was 53 years old, and she was wheeled into the emergency room. She was clutching her chest, she was sweating, she was nauseous, and they put her in the corner with the diagnosis of gastroenteritis and inflammation, infection of the stomach, and she proceeded to have a heart attack in the emergency room under the care of the doctors that I so deeply respected. And I looked around like, did anyone else see how awful this is? 
And it wasn't like anyone was as appalled as I was. Mm -hmm. And it was the beginning of my career. There was no such thing as women in heart disease. And that's all I wanted to do. And what we found out at that time was since 1984, more women than men were dying of heart disease. The 20 years before that, there was very little research on women. And even to this day, at the FDA is approving devices and medications with about 18% of women being part of these trials. So we are so far behind. And what, what do you think that contributes to that? Because I've heard this sort of like idea that, you know, women are just men with boobs and tubes. Really? I don't enjoy <laughs> that. Did you right? really hear that? I heard that, right? That was so Who said that? that? My doctor <laughs> said that to me at oh, one point. No. You, know, you know, well, women are just men with boobs and tubes. And I thought... Oh, I don't boy. think so. <laughs> <laughs> I've spent a little time around women and men, and I would say we're a little bit more different than that. Um, and so there's this idea of bikini medicine, though, that yeah. that's the only sort of areas that we look at as different. But it, it is true that women have different um, signs as showing, like, um, of heart symptoms, disease. signs yeah. of heart disease. And we have different ways that we uh, deal with stress maybe than a man does and different things that it affects our body? The most amazing thing that I don't think anyone really appreciated is how much women, we just feel. Mm -hmm. We are just, I, I always say, I, I, sorry to say this, but when men get stressed, they get diarrhea. I know I shouldn't say <laughs> diarrhea, anyway. It's okay, uh, we get it. It's, it's a medical it thing, is. we talk about we it. We talk about poop more, I yes. think, actually. It, <laughs> that's the next segment. I, I've had a long run of diarrhea, actually. Yeah. See, now I feel oh. better. We can <laughs> <laughs> But the truth is that when women get stressed, when women get depressed or anxious, we feel it. We know exactly what that feels like. That concept of heartache, I think it's real. And I think we all can say we know what heartache feels yeah. like. But the reality is, when women get depressed or stressed, it affects her heart way more than it affects a man's heart. And we didn't understand this inflammation, these stress hormones, how it can lead to heart disease. And here's a scary statistic. For women less than 55 years old, we always thought this was an old person's disease. Women less than 55, there's an increased incidence in heart disease. And we say, why? And my joke is, you know, we always wanted to be in a man's world and yay, we did it. We got their disease. Woo! Party. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's this juggling act. And we, in general, are such caregivers. And we forget about ourselves. We put everyone else first. We put ourselves last. And we're much more subtle. Men get this crushing chest pain. And women, we get shortness of breath, jaw pain, back pain, nausea. Even flu-like symptoms. Don't get nervous, everyone. You're like, that was my week. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. well, I, want, I have so many more questions for you. Would you stay around for one more segment for us? Sure. Great, excellent, thank okay. you. <laughs> Polio, help us out here. OK, um, well, you know, uh, you know, let's pause for just one moment for a word from our sponsor, another chapter out of Pixie's description, chapter 12, play. We all love to play. Because you're an adult doesn't mean you shouldn't have to play. Because we grow old, we grow old because we stop playing. And what William Shakespeare said 400 years ago still holds true today. The play's the thing. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. <laughs> Suzanne. <laughs> None of you know what happened in the commercial break out there in, in viewing land. You just missed it. You have to come live to the Kate Chapman Show to find out why I look like this. Um, anyway, uh, so I was reading this article recently that said that choirs of people, when they sing together, their heartbeats sink. And I wonder what you thought about that. I think it really explains the heart. You know, we all think of the heart as being this organ. It gets sick, it, it ha could have problems. We don't, we don't think about it. But if you really think about that metaphorical heart, it's really an incredible, incredible metronome to our lives. And that concept is what brings hearts together in synchrony. When you're sitting with someone, and if we were to hold hands, put your hand on my chest, I would put on yours like yoga, the, that concept, mm -hmm we would breathe in sync. Mm -hmm. Our hearts would beat together. And I think if we conceptually allow that, we would be a happier world. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think it would show that we are like, more, yeah, you can clap for yeah. that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's, 
I think that just the concept of that for me shows that we're more the same than we are different. It's about you know? opening our hearts. Yeah. If we allow it, we are more the same. You know, we talk about New York, many of us go through the day, just go through the day, what we need to do. We're very closed. But if we open our hearts to people, I'm fairly certain that they would beat instant. Yeah, I think maybe some heart disease would go away too, perhaps, if, if we weren't so closed off. Absolutely. Maybe. I, I look at a lot of um, other medical modalities, okay? So if we talk about, you know, sort of Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine and we look at Western medicine and the, and the things that kind of didn't translate across. But one of the things that, um, that Chinese medicine has is they talk about the, the different functions of the organs in and of themselves, like, I'm not saying this well, but energetically. Yeah. So the heart, you know, you've talked about how we all feel so much and women take it in. And, and so I, I wonder, is Western medicine reaching at all into those kind of other modalities yet to talk about how we kind of round out the care for patients? I think when I talk like this, my colleagues think I'm crazy, but... <laughs> <laughs> good, good, but speak, lady, okay. speak. Okay. I, I think that there's an understanding more now that there are some things we don't understand. I will tell you that years ago we would talk about yoga and people would look at me like I was crazy. And years ago, believe it or not, I got a research grant to study yoga in people with heart failure and watched hearts improve mm. from doing yoga and exercise. And, and believe it or not, also group support, having an, a community to, to talk to, mm. uh, a real support group. And I think that we're getting it a little bit, that the medical community is starting to understand there's some more things out there that we haven't really touched on. I'm glad to hear that because I, I, I would love to see, and this is what my work is about, I wanna like have everybody play together. You know, like you guys have a great idea about what makes us feel better, I have a great idea, you know, doctors have great ideas, and if we can all kind of bring them into a, a wider conversation of it, I think maybe we can take care of each other better, you know? I think you're right. One of the pieces that have definitely come into the medical community is this whole concept of the mind-body connection that really stress, there is documented disease now that stress can lead to the heart being stunned. Mm -hmm. And so there are organizations and different groups in the medical community that has psychologists and therapists and group support and psychiatrists and the understanding that we really need to talk to people about what's going on in their minds in order to take care of their hearts. And community is a big part of that, right? Because, Very like, big. you know, if you don't, if you're not used to speaking to people, then you know that it also gets hard too. I think that a lot of we have the, this idea of that social media is social. It's isolating. Yeah. When we talk about real community, it's sitting next to someone, looking at each other yeah. eye to eye. It's not, you know, through a screen. It's not on a text or. Twitter, um, yeah. <laughs> no, right? 40 characters, say it now. Right. Um, it, it's really about Get it that, all in, right? <laughs> get it, everything you feel in 40. Um, right. It's really about that connection, and you can't get that connection unless you're face-to-face. -face. So what, as we leave you, because I don't want to leave you because I stalked you, and I may stalk you a lot. <laughs> awesome, isn't she awesome? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, before I leave you, uh, I, think, I think one of the frustrations that I have experienced personally is that um, the way the system is set up, there's just not a lot of time that you physicians get to spend with us. Uh, for whatever reason, that is the way things are structured right now. So as a patient, when I go in, what is the best way that I can utilize that time with a physician so that we both get to, to you know, help each other out? Because I, I want to help the physician help me, and I want to be able to, you know, I think this is the most frustrating piece to both the doctors and the patients. And this is really, unfortunately, a reality of where we are in healthcare today. Before you go to the doctor, understand what you want to get out of that appointment. So this is, you have to go on a mission. You have to go in there understanding what you want to ask and what you want answered. And don't be afraid to question, but know very distinctly what you're looking for. So bring in your symptoms, list them, bring in all of your medical records, everything you have, put it in order so it's right there and available and accessible to the doctor. And make sure you have a list of your questions and you get every single question answered. And sometimes it really helps to bring someone with you 
because it's anxiety provoking and it's hard to process it and you might not get all of it. So bring someone so at least you might get half and the other person will get half right. and together you'll get all of it. Right. But the most important thing, something to do for free, never stop laughing. <laughs> never stop laughing. I think I that's the best that. thing you can do. I agree with that so much. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, this is been an incredible time. Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, thank you very much for joining us. doing good we're, we're about halfway there we're a little more okay um and 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 now i have to calm myself down a little bit again i'm so glad i put that there um so i think laughter is one of the best things that we can do and I also think that singing is, is highly underrated in society. And if we could all do it, that would be great. Um, so whatever I sing for the rest of the night, if you know it, please join. I love Paris in the springtime. Yes, sing along. I love Paris. The fall. I love Paris in the winter when it drizzles. I love Paris in the summer when it sizzles. I love Paris every moment, every moment of the year. I love Paris. Do I love Paris? Why do you love Paris? <laughs> I don't know. Let's think about this. Le fromage. Un. La baguette. Deux. Le Père Lachaise Cemetery. Ouais. Chopin. Ouais, there. ouais, ouais. Bellini is there. Ouais. Sanson is there. Everybody who was dead is there. If I don't think that we need to ask many questions about why I love Paris. Why? I love Paris in the spring. Don't forget the baguette, the baguette, the baguette. I love Paris in the fall. And the wine, and the wine, and the wine. I love Paris in the summer when it sizzles. What about the art? We forgot about the art. I love Paris in the winter when it drizzles. I love Paris every moment. And a moment. Every hour of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Paris. Why, oh why do I love Paris? I love Paris more, I think. I think you do. I think I do. I've been there more than you. Because my love is near. Fromage. The baguette. Poisson. The wine. Ouais. 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 You know, you can be in a vamp for a very long time. I thought we were playing out. We are playing out. We're out. Why do I love Paris? Because my love is near.
awesome Dorothy Holderman! <laughs> Here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, you are something that is new in the medical world, I think, something called a health coach. Yes. So please tell me what a health coach is. All right. So what's a health coach? Um, sometimes I think a health coach is the only person in the profession that actually focuses on health. Mm -hmm. Which is a strange thing. Right. Because <laughs> everybody strange. presumes when they go to the doctor's office, when they're going to place that they're gonna get health. But what they get is disease management. Mm. And health is something that's created each and every day by a series of habits. And health coaches are the people who are becoming experts at that. And they're studying, you know, the, the ancient um, Chinese Ayurvedic principles of dis-ease. I mean, before we have to go and get surgery or medicine, uh, there are signs that you're unwell mm -hmm. long, long before that. And we no longer really work with that. So health coaches are there. And, and to be honest with you, sometimes what I feel health coaches are, are sort of like the wise grandmas <laughs> that like don't exist anymore mm -hmm. because they're still telling you to, you know, have bagels, you know, right, right, even right. though they're <laughs> killing us, but they love us. Right, so, right. you know, and, and so the health coaches are the ones that are like studying health and they are also very much the people who are taking the time. I spend an hour with a person. Mm -hmm. I meet them every other week. I start to know everything about their life and I get that they're a whole person so they may come to me because they have sinus problems but that's never the only thing going on and what we look at is lifestyle issues and we now know that 80% of the disease of the disease management is just really lifestyle problems so there's no pill there is no surgery there is nothing that they can give you that's going to help you change your lifestyle and it's very very bio individual everybody's lifestyle has to work for them right so what's the difference though between like say a nutritionist and a dietitian versus a health coach well to a nutritionist and a dietitian it's all about just the food the ma mostly the macronutrients okay. Um, I'm a ver I am really a food first health coach. To me, it's it's really critical component. Yeah, you have a book called Love Food That Loves You Back. Yeah, I like, like that idea. What that, what what does that mean to you? Food that loves you back. It means that with all of the food on this planet, there are going to be foods for you that you're going to really enjoy that are going to give you all the energy you need. And you can create a new relationship with food. Too often we're eating food, within an hour we're feeling sick, but the next day we're picking the same food. So maybe our mouths like it, and we get a few minutes of pleasure, and you get trapped into this cycle because so much of this food is designed to be addictive. Right. All right, but let me, let me be blunt now. Go ahead. Tastes good. <laughs> no, not about that. Oh. I have to. I have to say something that's a little uncomfortable, but I want to say it because I okay. want to put it out there. Okay. You're not the skinniest person in the world. Why am I going to come to you to talk to you about food? Huh? <laughs> I mean, really though, right? Right. Well, I mean, you should have seen me get 70, 75 pounds heavier. Right. 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 <laughs> I don't know, to be really honest with you, I think people love coming to me because they know that I've lost 75 pounds and they know I still walk around saying, I want a pizza, right. I want more wine, I want right. baguettes. Right. <laughs> I mean, I get that, I get that. So people can be late. Right, I love that, I love that. And thank you for asking me the question. Or let, let me ask the question. It's a horrible question to ask, but I do think that in the health, like I remember when I used to look for you know um, trainers at the gym, I had a trainer once. It wasn't for me. <laughs> they yell at you. And they oh. hurt you. Oh. 
And I get it that people, it Ooh. doesn't work for me. Anyway, but I would look for the trainer with the best body, right? If I'm looking for somebody to fix what's wrong with me, I think, you know, I want the somebody that fixed it on themselves. But I don't think that that's always a, a great corollary, right? Because everybody's at a different space in their life. And also, you know, weight isn't the end all be all of everything. It's a it, picture of the It is 90% of the time people come to me and go, I want to lose weight. I'm like, okay, is it okay if we work on your health while we're at it? Right. Because it winds up being the same thing. Right. I mean, even with me, I'm on a continuum. Yes, I lost 75 pounds. My own health still needs tweaking and it gets tweaked and the weight does shift with it. Right. Your body does as it gets into a harmony your weight starts to become the weight for you. Now the weight for you doesn't necessarily mean the weight for a model. You're looking for, for harmony and balance and you know, sometimes people are just gonna not be models and, and you know, but they'll feel great. <laughs> not gonna be a model? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are. Okay, good. You are, you already are. <laughs> Well, okay, I wish I had more time with you, but I don't. This is like the, this is the frustrating thing. You get these like, great people on that tell me things that I want to know. Um, before we leave you, though, you have uh, an amazing time where you are a health coach to a bunch of nuns. Hmm. I, um, please please tell me how you got that job. Because I, and please tell me that the funny, right, exactly. <laughs> telling nuns what to do. No, you don't tell nuns what to do. It's just <laughs> a, you know, I have this illusion that oh, I was just going to get in there, work with their chef, and come up with these great, you know, dishes to get them. They're all, they're all, they're between 68 and 85. There's 13 of them. One of them has passed, but it was really not because it's of not me. It's not your so fault. Yeah. <laughs> I swear, it was not because of vegetable consumption. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I go into the first lunch, and there it is. They're having hot dogs, white bread rolls. You know, the salad is limp, and it, you know, it's like it's only up from here. But I'm, I'm telling you, this is this is a this is a tough group. And I mean, the best thing they say to me. All right, I'm 85. I really have to change right? what I eat. I don't want to change. But we have this mother superior who came from Australia, <laughs> who came healthy as an ox, and in one year she has this draw of pills that now she's on from the food that they oh. were eating. So she's like, I don't care if they don't, whatever. You have to have that, because she's used to, in Australia, right. she eats like, you know, she loves, she loves filet mignon. I mean, this is like, yeah. she likes to eat, she loves bread. But she loves vegetables too, and the difference between her health and the health of the other sisters is like is is huge. Yeah. So I go through this whole war. There's like groups, and they corner me, and they try to like get their favorite. But like we could have a little meatball, <laughs> maybe a meatball, and I'll be like, well, sure we can have a meatball. Can I make it of lentils? No, 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 no. Chicken? No, no. I need like a beef meatball. <laughs> so now I'm like, okay. I cannot go where I wanted to take them. So now we're getting grass-fed meat. We're doing things that, you know, I'm, I'm just having to work with them. With what they because want. Because if I come want. out with lentil meatballs, they're gonna be thrown at me. And these women are mean. <laughs> they take, you know, these are the people who took children's ears and cross them on the out. But you don't want to disparage them. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of another um, uh, recipe from Yumspiration in a Pixie's Prescription. It's a great recipe for jalapeno kale, and you need a whole bunch of wonderful items. But you know, this is a great uh, uh, dish to make this year because you might want to say kale to the chief. <laughs> you know, Kate, I, you know what a big, big theater fan I am. Yes, I do. Yeah, and I heard you brought me a very special guest today. I brought one just for you. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, she's not a great just guest today. She's also a wonderful guest tomorrow, tomorrow. I don't understand. Why would you be singing the song tomorrow? Well, maybe it's because she was one of the original orphans from Annie. Let's bring up Laura Dean!
one of the original orphans. I was one of the original originals. Right, Back before in, Broadway, before right? Before Broadway. At and the please good tell the good house. people why they fired you. I got tits and ass. <laughs> Which was, um, uh, at 13 years old, a normal thing, but they made me bind myself. It was horrible. It was horrible. Uh, Martin Charnin would give notes to the entire company. And then he'd say, and Laura, do something about your boobs. They're bouncing all over the stage. You know, and the reason that I have Laura here is because Laura and I have known each other for years and years. And we've sung together in the Broadway Inspirational Voices, run by Michael McElroy, founded and run by, it's a great, great choir. If you've not heard us sing, you really must. Um, Laura and I are, <laughs> are very, very, very lucky to be up there singing with just some of the most incredible gospel yeah. singers you've ever I mean, met. it was interesting what you said about singing in a choir. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we sing, what Michael makes us, not only do we sing, we try to sing as one voice, but we breathe mm -hmm. in the same spaces. We, uh, phrases, uh, all, the, all the dynamics yeah. are, are rehearsed and practiced and we're all in rhythm. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if they took our pulses and heart rates or EKGs mm -hmm. if we were all in sync. I actually kind of want to do that experiment with our choir to see what that would be like because I think it would probably be because I do feel like we're one when we're up yeah. there. But we've talked a lot about the over the years about your Annie things and I'm fascinated with it because every girl wanted to be Annie when they were of our age and you and I you, actually you, had the hair. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but I've heard those stories and, and I think you know one we'll talk about resiliency and what that does you know for a person um, but two I it always just sort of struck me that it's a little bit bizarre to me that women are spoken to in this way. Women? I was 13. You, right. And so you were even not even a woman yet. You were a young girl. So what did that do to kind of your vision of how you saw yourself? Well, yeah, I mean, growing up, it, I was basically told not to grow up. I mean, my mother dressed me in clothes that made me look like I was nine when I was 13 because, you know, they would hire older girls to play younger girls, but I developed. And so, you know, I was always hiding myself. Mm. Not anymore. That's right. <laughs> Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I have two daughters, and I tried to raise them, you know, feeling good about themselves and never feeling ashamed of their bodies. And how'd that work? Did it, I mean, did, how was did your, it work? Was well, your influence enough? Because I mean, it's not just, I mean, you're a mother and it's great that you have yeah. that. I mean, that's so wonderful that you give that to them, but there's like media and there's all these other yeah, things and, that talk to us. Yeah, and, and especially my older daughter who's five feet tall and she's not getting an inch taller. And then her younger sister is five foot 10. And so, you know, when my older daughter developed, you know, we grow, we grow sideways, then we grow up, we go, you know, she, she became very zoftic, and I always thought she was really comfortable in her skin, but then when she was 15, she kind of crashed and mm -hmm. decided to lose 20 pounds and went ahead and lost like 45 pounds. And, you know, it, it was a mess, and she was very sick. And, and, and I thought, how did that happen? Because I never made her feel, I never, I thought right. I never made her feel but as you learned, like even if your mother hadn't been dressing you to look younger, someone else made you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So you never know what influence, like you know, your daughter had that came from. Yeah, her. and I guess I didn't know that that she was putting on, uh, on the outside everything was fine, but it wasn't all fine on the inside. Right. So, so um, we'll just talk really briefly about resiliency first before before we go to our, our next little thing that we're going to do together. Um, being an actress, you have to uh, take no for an answer a lot. <laughs> Most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. right? And you've had some you know, great successes in your career. Not only did you do Annie, and I know that didn't end well, but you did Fame the Movie. Anyone? <laughs> I mean, I was obsessed. I kind of stalked her, too. I kind of make movie stalk people that are like, 
Um, but you, and then you were also on Friends, you know, which yeah. everybody knows Friends. So I mean, that's such a big. And thing. I did Tommy on Broadway yeah. for a year and a half. That was one of my favorites. I know you were Mrs. Walker, which is incredible. <laughs> that on Broadway. It was one of her favorite things to play. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it was that show. I, every night, I just, I could listen to that music night after night yeah. after night. Yeah. It was like, oh, no, I have to no. it was only, I, I became pregnant with my second daughter while I was doing it, and then it kind of got a little difficult. <laughs> Especially the, the costumes, that they, they right. kept letting them out and letting them out, and finally my dress was like, there's no more fabric left. <laughs> <laughs> you bounce back from the nose though what what is your what is like your kind of go-to way to like brush it off you know well first of all I allow myself to feel crappy for a little while because if you don't allow yourself to feel what you're feeling that's not healthy either so I let it out and then yeah you move on next audition next and also have a life outside of your work right. which was almost more important to me than my career, right. you know, to have a family and and to have a full life. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so if you're going to be an actress out there, have a life. Well, yeah, I mean, it's that's, No, I mean, that's good for me to hear, though, because I think sometimes in my career I've forgotten about having life. I think that that, that goes second. I think that any of us that have a career that's a little bit tough, it's easy for us to forget that that is the anchoring point and yeah. that the career is just a part of your life. Yeah, but you know, it's all about balance, but you know, everybody's journey is different and what's a life for me is not necessarily the same as what would make you happy. Do you know what I mean? Well, I'll move in with you after this and we'll find Okay. Out. Okay, uh, after the break, Laura and I are gonna sing a little gospel for you because it's what we love to do. And we've been standing next to each other for 18 years. If I don't stand next to her, I actually don't feel okay because <laughs> she's so great to be next to. So after the break, we're gonna have a little gospel with Laura Dean. Thank you.
Okay, we have come to the end. We're going to do a couple more things. One, uh, I just, I want to ask you, Paul, yes. in this last yes. hour, yes. if you could sum it up in one word, what would that word be? Hmm. Well, it's the word I always use. Fabulous. Woo! Good to know. Yeah. Um, Mayor, what, if, what about you? You know, I've been trying to think about what word that might be the whole afternoon, and I just can't come up with one. Just, mm. just one, because mm. your guests have been amazing. Your singing has been really great, and I think we should do this more often, Kate. Mm. Okay, but you didn't give me one word. <laughs> well, how about amazing? Mm. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Mm. Okay. Fabulous, amazing. That's not much to go off of. Mm. They're cute, but they're not helpful. Can mm. you give me one word of what you had in this last hour? Something you learned, something, anything. Um, one word? Yeah, I want mm. one word. Or heart. Mm. Ooh, I like mm. that. Okay. Yeah, very good. What about you, Lori? Delicious. Mm. Oh. Okay, anybody else want to yell out a word or two for me? Just yell out a word. Inspiring, Inspiring and joy. joy. Okay. So what Mary and I like to do... <laughs> Tepa. Tepa. <laughs> I heard that over here. Um, <laughs> for those of you who have not been around us, uh, we like to make up songs, and we like to do it on the spot, and we like to have help. And we like to um, see if they'll be good at the end of it. And some of them are great, and some of them not so much. So we'll see. It's, a, it's like, a, like um, opening up a fortune cookie. You don't know if it's going to be entertaining or not in bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's quick. OK. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I have writers that are writing for me, not at all. OK, so um, <laughs> our, words, our words that you've given to me, I have. Fabulous. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm conjuring the oh, okay. spirits. I'm conjuring, I'm conjuring. Yes. That's exactly what's happening. I feel fabulous. I was just in this place. It was like another word, and I feel fabulous. I didn't know we were starting. I was just... <laughs> 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 giving you a little dream music. Scary nightmare. Let's have a better dream music. Mm. Mm. That's better. It's amazing what you can do with an idea. It's amazing what you can do when you think I want to help. I like people to feel better. I like them to laugh. And so I wrote the show on your behalf. Mm. <laughs> it's good, Kate. You're welcome. Mm. Mm. It's my treat to you. It comes from the heart. I want you to have a better part of life today. So I give you free ways that you feel better. So you can be amazing like me. <laughs> like you. Like it's me. It's true. It's mm -hmm. true. I'm amazing. She's amazing. I'm delicious and inspiring too. You can strive to be like me. Be more like me. I'm telling you. It's Don't fun. just be you. Be more like Kate. Me. <laughs> I'm inspiring, delicious, and fun. And I know how to get a job done. I don't know how you pulled this off. You hire lots of people, and you tell them what to do. And you say, come on, it'll be fun for you, too. Really? Sometimes it's not fun, but that's all right. <laughs> I'm delicious and amazing, and everyone loves me. We do, we do. You should be more like me. <laughs> Today, as you take your leave of this place, know that life is just one long race. And in the end, the one who's in first place will be is you. dead. Will be you? No, it, they're dead, because we all die. But <laughs> until be amazing, like me. Like you. Like, like Kate. 
like you, like, like Paul, like, like me, like you, like me, Who? like them, everybody, like and, me. and Paul, yeah. like and Paul. me. You better think, think, think about what you're trying to do to me, yeah. 